All right. Um, so I think I have a good shot at finishing your homework number three material today, um, starting with some conceptual ideas and then moving forward to um, uh, a combo circuit. I'll show you the kind of process for analyzing a circuit which has a bunch of series and parallel elements all together and it can be kind of challenging to know where to start. Um, before I do that, uh, again, as I mentioned, let me start with the conceptual. So we mentioned that one of the main advantages of a, of a parallel circuit, here's an example of a parallel circuit. Uh, make sure you understand why all those things are in parallel, even though only two of them are physically in parallel. Uh, they are all um, just two different, or they're just different options to get between the higher voltage equipotential and the lower voltage equipotential. And one of the main advantages is that every single path here uh, will allow a complete uh, drop from top to bottom. If you take out one of the paths, say this one, you take it away, it doesn't mean that the flow of electricity is completely um, not allowed, it's just not allowed through that branch. You still have two perfectly viable paths to get from A to B. So an example of where you want to use this is like Christmas lights. They certainly don't look like this. In fact, Christmas lights are made to look almost like they're in series, but they're not. There is actually a wire that connects every Christmas light, each individual bulb from beginning to end. And that's why when any one bulb goes out, the other ones, not only do they not turn off, they don't even change a, a bit what they're doing. So that's one of the things that we talked about in the parallel circuit is that every bulb has the same current itself and power dissipation itself that uh, whether it's connected alone or with a bunch of other branches. Um, so this here, this kind of thing uh, where you have a, a gap, it's called an open circuit. So think of it as like an opening or a gap where electricity can't flow. Okay. So basically, it's a path which now has infinite amount of resistance. There's no way for charge to go through it. There's an insurmountable gap. Um, that's, of course, why you don't want to put Christmas lights actually in series. If you have Christmas lights in series, like so, if you happen to have one bulb burn out, which means it literally melts and the pathway disappears and you have an open circuit, then of course what happens, if you have an open circuit, the current will immediately go to zero. And one of the questions that I sometimes get is, doesn't the current flow until it reaches the uh, gap? No. Uh, remember that the entire system is filled with charge carriers. And the word gets around very quickly that there's a break in the system and no, nobody will flow anymore. Okay? So the moment that that open, uh, opening is created, the entire current stops. Okay? So um, that seems like a very major flaw in the design of Christmas lights to put them in series, but there are times where this feature is actually good. Let me show you an example. I'm going to have a device where this resistor is a stand-in for some expensive piece of electronics equipment. And that piece of electronics equipment, it's intended to dissipate a certain amount of energy to heat based on the current that it should normally receive. So obviously the amount of current uh, that is going to go through there should be something that you expect. And that current, because it's in series, the current will be the same through this first resistor as well. There's no forks in the throat, so the current is what it is. But let's say that you have some external input of current, say a surge, right? There's some kind of problem 
and there's a current surge, meaning that the current increases far more due to some external reason than simply just because of the resistances that you have in the way. Okay, so the current suddenly increases. Well, that is, of course, in danger. If your current increases, then the power dissipation is potentially going to increase through your very expensive device. Well, this thing here, this first resistor, is going to be what's called a fuse. So a fuse is basically just a little piece of material. It's usually just a thin piece of wire, actually. And its whole purpose is it's designed to take a certain amount of current and no more, but if you send more current through it than it expects, it's designed to purposely melt. The heat dissipation, the power dissipation in that, if the current exceeds a certain amount, it is designed to melt. Okay? So, now we're talking. That creates the open circuit, and it protects your very expensive device from melting instead. Okay? So the fuse, it doesn't really matter if it's after or before, okay? You can't be too held up on the order of these things. Remember, the entire system is filled with charge carriers, and if there's a break at any point, this is an opening or an open circuit, then the flow will stop, okay? So what do you do? You go to the hardware store, and you buy another fuse. They cost like five cents. It's a little piece of wire inside a little, um, usually a little glass case because then you can look in there and see if it burnt out or not. You can look for, you should always buy the fuse that's rated to the appropriate amount of current. So look at the device. The device, the manufacturer knows that this thing, if you send more than, you know, whatever, five amps through this, it's going to be damaged. So you want to couple it with a five amp fuse, right? Because it does no good if your protective device will only burn out at 10 amps, but your device gets damaged at 5 amps, right? So you want to match the fuse appropriately. So if you ever need to go to the hardware store, make sure that you're buying a fuse. Read the back of the device first to make sure that it's the right one. There's two things you need to know. First of all, how much current is the right amount, and then there's also, when you buy fuses, it's, there's, they're called slow blow and fast blow. A fast blow fuse, as soon as you hit too much current, it's designed within a very short time span to go. A slow blow is one where if you sustain the too much current over a long period of time, then it will go. The idea being is that the device is a little bit more hardy to momentary surges, but if you really let the current be too much for an extended period of time, you are going to damage it. Okay? So those are the two things when you're going out to the hardware store and you're buying a fuse. What's the amperage? What's the rating you should have with your device? And it should be a slow blow or fast blow fuse. Okay, so make sure you always buy the right thing. Because it's a lot easier to replace a fuse than it is to replace the entire device. So there, the idea that if one element in a series goes out, becomes an open circuit, knocking the whole thing out, that's a feature now, not a flaw like it is in Christmas lights. Does that make sense? So you can see that in different applications, uh, sometimes series is what you want, sometimes parallel is what you want. They both have their place. So um, let's go ahead and do some more conceptual examples. I guess this will be my official conceptual example number one. You'll have, you have uh, some of these on your homework where it doesn't give you any numbers, it just kind of uh, gives you the general gist of the setup and asks you when you do this to the circuit, does this increase or decrease or whatever, things like that, okay? So let's take a look. My first circuit, battery, one resistor, R1, another resistor, R2, um, and then I'm going to have a switch over here like this. So you can label switch S if you want, or it obviously already looks like a switch. And when I close the switch, I'm going to ask what happens to the following quantities. I'm going to ask what happens to I total, 
I1 and I2. Okay, so what happens to the current? I'm going to ask what happens to the voltage drops, V1 and V2. What are the voltage drops across the resistors? And the power dissipation, of course, as well. Oh, and I forgot. Uh, oh, where do I squeeze it in? I guess, let me put it in the top here. What happens to R equivalent? Okay. And of course, um, the power is the one thing we can observe if these resistors happen to be light bulbs, then a small percentage of the uh, heat that they dissipate will come out as light, so we're actually going to hook it up and observe. So this very circuit I'll connect for you and I'll show you that what I claim to happen it does really happen. Okay. So let's close the switch. So. Um, I guess before we even close the switch, we should establish what happens. Um, before you close the switch, current flows like this. Of course, since the switch is open, open circuit, right? Then the R1 and R2 are in series. There's only one path available in the circuit with the switch not yet being closed. Current will, whatever I total is, will pass through uh, resistor one and then continue on through resistor two. Okay, so R equivalent at first is going to be R1 plus R2, and then we're going to ask what happens to it. Of course, the total current um, is going to be then established by that. It's established by how much resistance is in the path. In this case, R1 and R2 are both in the way. Okay, um, and then the voltage drop of course, it's going to be somehow distributed between them with the voltage waterfall looking like this. First you drop some voltage across V1, then you drop the remaining across the other resistor for a two-step path. Of course, those two things are not necessarily equal. We learned last time that one of the hallmarks of a series circuit is that the larger resistance in the chain will take the lower voltage drop. So it's not necessarily split up equally. So that's kind of like our situation to begin with, right? We have equipotential region A. That's the highest voltage. That's up here. We only have a single option how to get from A to a lower resistance. Of course, that is going through resistor 1. There's my middle equipotential plateau or step. And then of course we have our lowest voltage equipotential, which is going to be down here. I'll call that C. And again, before we close the switch, we only have one choice on how to get from B to C, and that's going through resistor 2. So that will al uh, allow us to kind of understand a little bit of what's going on before we close the switch so we know what values we're starting with. We just have a classic series circuit. We have a two-step drop from top to bottom. The voltage drops may not necessarily be equal, but they will add up to the battery voltage. And they will both dissipate some power as well. And of course, we learned again in a series circuit, the larger resistor, whichever one it is, I don't know here because I didn't give you the values, but whichever one of the resistors is larger will not only have the most voltage drop, it will dissipate the most power. Okay? All right, so let's see what happens when we close the switch. If we close the switch, we find something has happened. We've essentially given a shortcut for around resistor 2. We've actually merged equipotential regions B and C. Okay? So now B and C are not separate anymore. B and C are the same. This is called a short circuit. A short circuit, you probably have heard that mostly in terms of something being a bad thing or an unintentional thing. That's just one example of a short circuit. A short circuit is any time you create a path in a circuit where the resistance is basically zero. Okay? So we've basically given a short, short circuit or shortcut a free path for the charges to go, and they will not 
go through R2 for free, okay? So I'll give you two different reasonings for why this is, but what we're going to find is that um, B2 is going to decrease to zero, and of course, so is its power, and so is its current. Basically, for all intents and purposes, R2 has no, is not even in the electrical flow anymore. I'll give you two reasons, way, ways to visualize that. The first, if you want to think of that as, as parallel, you can think of R2 is in parallel with this new branch with no resistance whatsoever, right? Okay, so reasoning number one is that R2 is in parallel with a short. And one of the things we learned about parallel is that more charge goes through the easy way, right? Path of least resistance. So as you can imagine, more charges are going to go through the easy way, right? Why would you go through a resistor when you could go through no resistance? Now we talked about the fact that, of course, that um, generally speaking, even the higher resistance path gets a little trickle of current, right? So when we did our example last time, we showed that um, more, more charge, more current goes through the easy path, but some still goes through the hard way. This is the extreme case where one path is completely free, right? This is like, imagine like we were talking about the analogy of mo if you have the highway and the local roads, most people will take the highway. But no, some people, it still makes sense to take the local roads. Imagine that the highway was a super highway. It had like 15 lanes. Everybody would take it, okay? Why wouldn't everybody take it? There's no advantage anymore to taking the hard way. So what happens here is that all of the current goes through the short because it has no resistance at all and no current through R2 anymore. So if you don't like that explanation, let me think of it in a slightly more sophisticated manner. As I already mentioned, we've merged equipotential regions B and C. They're one and the same plateau. So what's the voltage difference across the ends of this resistor? There is none, okay? So we've merged the equipotentials on the both ends of R2. Therefore, the voltage drop available across that is zero. And charges, they're not going to do anything for free, okay? Charges will burrow through an obstruction for one reason and one reason only, and that is because they have an energy reward for doing so. And now there is no reward. All they would gain by burrowing through that obstruction is get to the exact same voltage they had when they were already on the other side. There's no advantage to going across. So if you think of it like this, it's like if you have a ball, it will fall down even through an obstruction as long as it can seek lower ground. But then you put that same obstruction and you expect the ball to go from this side of it to this side. It's not going to go sideways, right? You have to give some motivation energetically for that to happen. And so you can see if that's zero, then the current has to go to zero. So same ultimate conclusion. So there's no question hopefully that resistor 2 is completely gone now. All the current will actually, instead of going through R2, it's all routed through the short. Are there any questions on that so far? Okay. So it all goes through the shortcut. Now, we also have to be careful. It's not just the same total current that is getting rerouted in a different way. The total current itself will change. 
because remember the total current is going to be determined by resistance in the way, and we have far less resistance in the way. Now, the only thing standing in the path of electrical flow is resistor 1. In fact, the equivalent resistance of the circuit goes from R1 plus R2 to just R1. So if we have the circuit overall has less resistance, what's going to, that going to mean to the total current being supplied? More current, that's right. So the total current is going to increase. And I should mention that I total and I1 are still are actually the same thing. Even though I put in this short, this short does not change the fact that the current has to go through R1 in total before this split, right? So I total and I I1 are the same. That's true whether the switch is open or closed. So the total current is going to increase. Okay? So if we look at V1 equals I1 R1, if the total current increases through resistor 1, what does that mean about the voltage drop? So if this is increased, this is the same, what has to happen to the voltage drop here? It has to increase. And in fact, we can easily reason out how much voltage drop has to be there now. It has to be all of it. So what has happened when we close the switch, we've essentially totally taken this resistor out. We've basically brought B down to here. Right? We've brought the region B and we've tied it down to the lower terminal of the battery. That means all the voltage drop has to be across the other one. So this is what it looks like after you close the switch. You have the battery. You have region A. But now B has joined C. And if that, that then means that all the drop has to be across resistor 1. So I can say over here, it not only increases, but increases up to the battery voltage. So what we've done is we've now taken the job that used to be shared by resistors 1 and 2, and we've put it all on resistor 1. So for those of you that plan to go into medicine, okay, and you want to do bypass surgery, this is basically a bypass surgery operation. Okay? If you're trying to fix something, some kind of uh, you know, some problem in the blood vessel, right? You need to be able to work on it without blood coming through it. So you put in what's called a bypass, right? So the thing to be aware of is if you put in a bypass so you can work on this, it will have effects elsewhere. It taxes the things over here. Because if the blood flow does not have as much resistance now because you're bypassing one of these elements, it's going to put more stress on other things, okay? So basically we're doing a bypass operation here to do some repairs or whatever we want to do to R2, okay? Um, all right, so what do we have left? The power, of course. Well, we've already established that the voltage and current increase, so there's no question that there's going to be more power dissipated in, res in resistor 1, okay? Now that we've it's not sharing the job with R2, it's basically all of the, the action is at, on resistor 1. So what are we looking for for predictions? We're looking for resistor 1 is going to get brighter, and resistor 2 is going to uh, get less bright. In fact, it's going to decrease to 0. Okay? So let's hook it up. Let's try it. Hopefully you believe me. So, get our setup that we've been using the last couple lectures. Let's put our two resistors in series. That's how they're going to be at first. I'll go ahead and put, it uh, doesn't really matter what order they're in, but I'll, I'll go ahead and do this. I don't remember what I was doing before. So here are our two resistors in series. Like so. We see that they, again, do not blow equally. The larger resistance 
just as a reminder, more voltage drop, more power dissipation. That's what happens in series. And then here's my bypass. Okay, so my bypass is just going to be a piece of wire with no electrical resistance. So I'm going to connect it from here, region B, the middle one, and I'm going to tie it over here. What are we expecting? This one is getting bypassed, so it's going to turn off. And this one, it's all going to be on this one. Okay, so let's try it. Oh, you can't really see it. Let me bypass the other one. This will, this will be more obvious, I think. So whichever one we bypass, that one turns off and the other one gets brighter. There we go. That looks good. Okay. So this one, no chargers want to go through it. They have a free ride around it. And then this one has to take the entire voltage drop instead of sharing it with this one. Okay. So the short circuit. Um, let's say you work for the electric company. Okay, let's say you work for PG&E. If you want to do some repairs on this, you really don't want to be trying to do repairs while there's electrical current flowing through it. So you're doing your repairs over here. Okay, that does have an effect on other things down the line. Okay, so their short circuit isn't always bad. It's that you have to know that's what you're doing. Now, why do you hear of short circuits as being a bad thing, right? You think, oh, this thing is short circuited. I have to throw it away and buy a new one. Okay, so let's say you drop your Let's say you drop your iPhone in the bathtub, right? Don't want to do that. When you try to start it, the screen doesn't turn on. What's going on there? Well, you got water in there. And water is not a, ter a terrible conductor. It's actually pretty, pretty good. And so if there's a drop of water that connects two parts of the circuit that shouldn't be connected, then it allows a shortcut around it. And if this is, represents the uh, parts of the phone circuitry that turn on the screen, the screen's not going to turn on. Because the charges have a free ride. They're not going to turn on the screen for you because the charity, they do it because of energy motivation. And if you give them a free ride, they're not going to go through a resistor just because you want them to. So, what do you do if you drop your iPhone in the bathtub? Your only hope is that those connections, those shorts, are temporary, right? Once the water evaporates, maybe you won't have this anymore, okay? But one of the worst things you could do is try to, if, let's say you get lucky enough that you drop it in the bathtub while it's off, right? Well, when, you, when your phone is off. One of the worst things you could do is try to turn it on too soon, okay? The reason why is that these shorts are still in place. The water is allowing some of the circuitry to get bypassed other parts of the circuit that are not being bypassed are going to be taxed more, right? So you don't want something that normally is doing this to have to do this because it might dissipate more power than it's designed to and it might be permanently damaged, okay? So that's where the permanent damage comes from is that when certain parts of the circuit are bypassed with a short, other parts bear the, more of a brunt of it, okay? So, if you remember nothing else from this class, okay, remember if you ever get a piece of electronics wet, let it dry for a long time before you try it again. And then you might get lucky that there was no permanent damage, okay? I know I've saved at least one student's iPhone like this. They emailed me five years after <laughs> and told me that they remembered this and the phone worked. <laughs> after they turned it on after a couple days of letting it thoroughly dry out, okay? Okay, so that's why we normally think of a short circuit as a, as a bad thing. It's not good or bad, it's just whether or not you expect it or not. If you're uh, doing PG, PG and E and you want to do some repairs, then short circuit is your friend. If you're trying to do bypass surgery, short, short circuit is your friend. But if it's unintentional because of something that got into the circuit that you don't want, then it might not be a good thing, okay? So, the next thing I want to talk about, um, in conceptually speaking, um, is what if it's not a short circuit, but it's just another resistor? What changes? Not much. It's just that it doesn't quite happen this extremely, okay? So, let's do that.
Um, what happens if you have R1, R2, and we'll attach a third resistor, R3? So, now we know that the current through resistor 2 is not going to go straight down to zero, right? We're not giving a total free ride around resistor 2. We're giving another option, but R3 may be a very large resistor, so, you know, or even if it's small, it's still going to have some current through I2. So, let's think about this. Well, one of the ways to think about this is that it's R2 and R3 are in parallel, but they are in a series combo with R1. Okay? So what we've done is we've gone from this, R1 in series with R2, I guess I don't need to draw the whole thing, I've gone from this to this. R1, R2, and 3. Now there, I've purposely drawn R2, 3 as a pretty small resistor, because remember, when you add resistors in parallel, it makes the resistance go down, right? So, if we're talking about R2 alone, whatever resistance that has, when you add an extra option with it, then the resistance of 2 and 3 together is going to be lower, right? Do you see what I did there? I purposely tried to draw this value. This is decreasing. The R2 compared to R2, 3. R2, 3 is smaller. So, now we remember one of the most important things about series circuits. In series circuits, the voltage drops will be in proportion to the resistances. Okay? So what it means is that if you have like a tiny resistor and a huge resistor, the huge resistor takes more of the voltage drop, right? But if you have two resistors that are more even, the voltage drops will be more even. So what we've just done is we've changed the proportion of voltage drops. Now, the R1 looks like the big one, right? Of course, R1 hasn't changed, but R1 in comparison, right? So this one will take more voltage drop, and this one will take less simply because we've changed the ratio of resistances. Okay? So, they still have to both add up to, of course, the battery EMF, but now the amount of which they proportion is different. So, if we were to draw what this looks like now, if before we had V1 and V2 that were maybe something more close to even, now we have something that looks more like this. So V1 takes more, and oh, I guess I should call this V2, 3. That's less. Okay? So this one is more than it was before, and this is now less. So that's one of the most important things you can remember about series circuits, is that the voltage drops across each element are different, and the more, you, more one is larger or one is smaller, it changes how much they all take of the total voltage drop available from the battery. So if you increase the resistance in the chain, it will take more of the voltage drop than it used to. If you decrease the resistance in the chain, it will take less than it used to. So that's what we have. We've messed around with one of the resistances in the chain. We've changed R2 to R2, 3. That takes less, and then of course the other one has to pick up the slack and take more. It's not that we've changed the value of R1, but something has to take up the slack, right? Because the total drop is set by the battery. Now, how is this different than before? Not really much different. We still found that V1 increased and V2 decreased like we did before. It's just not as extreme. 
Before, V2 decreased all the way down to zero because, of course, it was a complete short, and V1 increased, and it took the whole thing. So what we had was that V2 got smaller, in fact, all the way down to zero, and V2 got as large as it could possibly get. This is just a more moderate situation, right? This is where V2, V2, 3 is now smaller, but not zero, and V1 is larger, but not the whole thing, okay? So what we're going to see is the same exact thing we saw before, okay? We're going to see that since V1 increased, P1 will increase. Since V2 uh, decreased, P2 will decrease. So that's exactly what we saw before. The only difference is that P2 will decrease, but not completely turn off, okay? So let's try it. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to give an extra root, but the extra path will not be totally free, it will be an extra resistor, okay? So let's watch. So I'm going to bypass the first one. The, what we'll see is the one that gets bypassed is going to be glow dimmer but not totally turn off like it was before, right? We're not giving a totally free ride. We're just giving an extra option. If we give an extra option, then um, that will drop the um, voltage drop across the first one. And then this one, of course, is going to increase. So let's try it. So connect this, see if I can get it, and watch the one that gets bypassed, or the one that uh, has the extra branch gets dimmer. Hopefully you saw that this, this, well, this one gets dimmer. Let's try it again. This one gets dimmer, and this one gets brighter, right? Right, when I connect it. So it's just a milder version of the thing we saw before, right? This gets dimmer, but doesn't turn off completely, and this gets brighter, but it's not as bright, okay? And the reason why, of course, is that the extra path is not totally free. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, this one has a, um, a very practical application to your lab because what you guys, um, I think you've already used one, but um, you guys will continue to use a device called a voltmeter. Okay. So a voltmeter, at this point, has been kind of a um, magic device that just reads out voltage difference and yet yeah, we haven't really talked about how it works. This third resistor, well this could be a voltmeter. A voltmeter is a device that has resistance. You can think of it as just a resistor, but it's a resistor that has a special ability to read out the voltage drop across itself. Okay, That's what a voltmeter is. It's basically a resistor that can speak, okay? And tell you, here's the voltage drop that I'm experiencing right now, okay? So, let's talk about that. A voltmeter it can, it's a device that reads the voltage drop across itself, okay? It's not psychic, it has no idea what's going on and what you've connected it to, it's just reporting something about itself, okay? So we want to take advantage of the fact that voltage is the same in parallel, so we connect it in parallel with things. So you connect in parallel with the resistor of interest. Because your ultimate goal is not to measure something about the voltmeter itself. In fact, if you knew, could somehow know what was going on in the circuit, then you wouldn't even need a voltmeter, right? If you're interested in what's going on in the circuit, and connecting a voltmeter is just an annoyance that you have to go through to find out what's going on. So, 
What you're doing here, if you're interested in the voltage drop across R2, you're connecting the voltmeter, which is another resistance, and it's measuring the voltage drop across the cell, but of course it's connected between the same two equipotentials as the R2, right? But here's the thing. By very, the very nature of connecting an extra resistance, you change the circuit. By me trying to measure what's going on, you're going to change what's going on. Right? We just talked about the fact that if you connect this, you connect an extra branch, you are going to actually decrease the voltage across the thing that you're trying to measure. Right? You are changing the ratio of voltage drops. You are, you are decreasing the very voltage you are trying to measure. So there's no free lunch here. There's a cost to knowing. If you want to know what the voltage is across a particular resistor, the cost is it's actually going to decrease that slightly. So what you're reading is not quite as large as it was before you got there and connected up your device. Now obviously we don't want to come in and be a wrecking ball. We don't want to take something that was 5 volts before we got there and we plug in the measurement device is such a wrecking ball that it only reads 2 volts. Okay? We want it to be so small of a cost to knowing that we're confident that what the voltmeter is reading is what was basically happening before we connected it, right? So if we're going to do that, we definitely don't want this to be a short. We learned that the short is the worst thing, right? A short is going to actually make this go all voltage drop go to zero. In fact, we want this to be as high of a resistance path as possible. So we want the voltmeter to have a very high resistance. We want to make that extra path so horribly bad that very few charges would take the opportunity to actually go through it. We need just a little trickle, just enough to do the measurement, but we don't want to divert a major amount of flow to the measurement device. If you look at the equation in parallel, we learn it's a 1 over rule, right? So that's the rule we would use. If we could, we would want the resistor of the voltmeter to be infinity, a very high value, because what's 1 over infinity? Basically, it's 0, right? So that would go away, and we would have that there is really no cost at all. We haven't really changed the resistance from what it used to be, right? If we add an extra path where there is absolutely super hard to get through, then essentially the circuit is still as it was, right? Of course, do you have the then a problem? If nothing wants to go through the voltmeter at all, then you have nothing to measure with, okay? So in reality, the voltmeter is a very high resistance, but it's not zero, it's not infinity. Usually it's something on the order of mega ohms. Okay, so around a million ohms, which is all well and good unless your resistors that you're trying to measure are also in the million ohms, and that's a big problem. So uh, one of the things that we have to watch out for is if you have very large resistances in your circuit, you have to buy a specialized voltmeter to work with that, which has an even higher resistance. So the thing is, you're trying to not be a wrecking ball, but it is technically true that if you connect a voltmeter, first of all, again, you want to always connect it in parallel. So take your two prongs, your red and your black. Because you're connecting it in parallel, you just throw them in. It's an extra branch. Volt, volt, measuring voltage is easy. Because you just connect the, the red and the black wherever you, to two different points, and that'll tell you the voltage difference between them. You don't need to break in the path or anything like that. You just stick in the voltmeter. It's very easy. You put it in parallel with the thing that you care about the uh, voltage in. It technically speaking does decrease the very voltage you're trying to measure because you're adding an extra path. And you, if you add an extra path, you start messing with the ratio of voltage drops. But 
Practically speaking, if you have a well-designed voltmeter, it has a very high resistance, so the effect on the circuit is minimal. Probably the amount that the voltage decreases is, is in the decimal place that is even off the end of your device. So it was probably five volts across that resistor before you put the voltmeter in, and it's probably 4.9999 volts decreased, but not very much when you connected the voltmeter. So I just want you to get a sense that there is a little bit of a cost. Whenever you add a measurement device to a circuit, you are adding another resistor, and that adding another resistor does change what's going on. We just want to minimize that, okay? Um, I have any questions on that so far? Yeah. So in our lab, when we came out of the power box, That is the ammeter, so okay. I'll talk about that next. Okay. So, uh, the ammeter, are there any questions on the voltmeter before I do the ammeter? Yeah. Do good voltmeters use internal calculations to compensate for the um, change in voltage? Uh, well, they would have no way of knowing that, right? They, they can't, they're not psychic, they don't know what the circuit overall is like, so there's no way for them to know that. There's no way for them to know about all the different resistors that you've connected that are not, you know, they basically only connect across one resistor of interest. So there'd be no way for them to compensate. The only way they can compensate is by being extremely high resistance. So therefore they don't really, they siphon off a little extra trickle of current to measure, but um, they're not a huge wrecking ball of the circuit. It's not like we're throwing a short circuit which can have a gigantic effect on the voltage drops that you're trying to measure, the very voltage drops you're trying to measure. Okay, so let's, let's, I, let's go ahead and talk about the ammeter because the ammeter is, uh, it's nice to compare and contrast these two. So the ammeter, I don't know why they don't call it an amp meter, I guess it just kind of flows a little better if you throw, take the P off, okay? So an ammeter, as is suggested, is what reads current. So it's a device that reads the current through itself, okay? All it is is a special device, a resistor that can talk to you, okay? A resistor that can report to you in an analog or digital readout how much current is passing through it. So, of course, you don't really care about the measurement device. If you would know that value, you'd have no need for the measurement device. But what you want to do is you want to exploit the fact that current is the same in series. So what you do is you connect it in series with the resistor of interest. Because then you can be assured that the current that flows through the ammeter is also the same as the current that flows through the resistor of interest. You can put it just before, you can put it just after, you just have to make sure that there are no forks, right? So for instance, let's say you had our circuit like this, R1, R2, R3. Let's say you were interested in measuring the current through resistor two. Well, this is the current through resistor 1. It splits off, goes through 2, and goes through 3. So this is a flow that has some branches. And so you do not, if you're going to put in an ammeter, you have to be careful to not put it in where there's I1 or I3 flowing if you're interested in measuring I2, right? So here you have two options. You can either clock it on the, right on the way in or right on the way out, but it has to be somewhere on this branch, right? So it has to be somewhere on this branch because that's the branch that I2 flows. So you have two options, one of which is to do it right before, it, so right when the current, clock the current right before it goes through there, or of course the other option is to clock it right after it exits. Doesn't really matter. You get it either way. One of the tricky things of placing something in series is the fact that you have to put it in a row, which means that there will be a break required in the circuit. So when you are measuring current, you have to put a break into the path. So you have to disconnect this, 
and then put the ammeter into the main flow. This is not an extra branch. You have to make sure that the main flow goes through the ammeter before it goes through the resistor of interest. You can put it just before or just after, but a break in the path is necessary. Okay? So that's something really important to remember in lab, this idea that the, um, a break is necessary. Okay? A break is necessary, which means that if the light bulb, for instance, that you're trying to measure the current through is staying on while you're connecting it, well, you've done something wrong. You need to break the path and put the ammeter in. Okay? Um, now, because the ammeter is put in series, of course, when we have a series circuit, we're adding an extra resistance into the main flow. It's not a side branch, it's an extra thing. So as you can imagine, if you increase the resistance, it's going to decrease the very current that you're trying to measure. Okay? So you're decreasing the very current that you're trying to measure. But there's a cost to knowing. Notice the cost is always that you're decreasing the thing that you want to know. Now, obviously, we do not want to put in like some crazy amount of resistance. Uh, if we put in a ammeter of resistance mega ohms into the main flow, that would shut that current down pretty effectively, right? So we want a low resistance of the ammeter, right? So in ammeter, we want a low resistance. So for instance, if we're talking about R equivalent of the R2 plus R of the ammeter, right? That would be, I guess, let me put it as R2 and ammeter, so just those two. We're using the addition rule now because they're in series. What we hope is that this basically has approximately zero resistance. Then we can hope that the resistance of that branch is still roughly just R2. So what that means then is let's get the resistance as low as possible. Now that's a lot harder because if we're trying to make the resistance high, it's easy to make it high, but there's only so much we can do to lower it. So typically, maybe you'd be lucky if the ammeter had a resistance of half an ohm, but that's about as low as you can get it unless you're willing to spend some big bucks to get even lower, okay? Question? So it does change the circuit, but it still tells you exactly what winds up going through the resistor, right? Absolutely, but that what ends up going through there is slightly less than it would have before you connected the device. So there's a cost to know it. Connecting the device will change the thing that you're trying to know. It's just we hope it changes it almost none, okay? So, an ammeter has an extremely low resistance, and this, if you haven't already, someone has blown the fuse on, someone, someone will blow the fuse on the ammeter, okay? Because, remember, voltmeters get connected in parallel, ammeters get connected in series. So, someone will always do something like this, okay? They'll connect the ammeter like that. So what have you just done? You've just short-circuited the battery terminals. You basically put in a very low resistance option. Nothing is going to go through the main circuit, really. And you just send a huge surge of current here. Okay? So the, the, the danger is connecting an ammeter incorrectly. Because you're if you connect an ammeter incorrectly, you have basically short-circuited something. What will happen is your fuse will blow in your ammeter. These are designed to, uh, for students to make incorrect connections. And then you go up sheepishly to your lab instructor and say, my ammeter's not working, and then they'll put a new fuse in it for you and you're off and running again, okay? But please do not connect ammeters in parallel with anything. They should be in series with something that you're trying to measure the current through, okay? Um, no, 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 okay? Even if you connected an ammeter here accidentally like this, again, luckily you still have resistor one in the path, so you've not, you're not gonna really be in danger, but you still might pop the fuse on the ammeter. 
connecting a voltage voltmeter incorrectly is a lot more, less of a hazard. If you accidentally put a voltmeter in series, well, if you just put a mega ohm resistance in the main flow, it's just going to make the current go way down. You're going to shut down the current. Shutting down the current is a lot less dangerous than having the current be go too high, right? So this also no, but this triple no, okay? So that's a little bit about voltmeters and nanometers, and hopefully that helps you connect them correctly, uh, because in the coming weeks, next week and the following week, um, and possibly even after that, you'll be having lots of labs where you connect voltmeters and nanometers. It's really important to do it correctly. Okay, um, so let's see if we can move on forward here to uh, a big combo circuit, and let's break it down, and hopefully we can finish this today. Lots of uh, problems. This is basically what homework three culminates in: is the ability to break down a complex circuit. Let me go ahead and draw it. I'm going to purposely draw it kind of weirdly shaped because this is often how they look in lab. You don't have nice boxy shapes. R1, R2. R3, R4. Let me give you the values. Like so. And The obvious question is, of course, can we find anything we want to about any of these uh, things? Um, I'm going to go ahead and make a chart to organize my information. So I can kind of store it up as I go. I suppose I could add an extra uh, column for power, but once I have the current and voltage, power is easy. I just multiply I times V. So let's find, make sure we can find the current through each resistor, and make sure we can find the voltage drop across each one. Okay. So um, my problem solving strategy. Here's how I suggest a recipe to attack circuits. First, draw the equipotential regions. So set up what are your plateaus so that we can correctly identify what's happening. My highest voltage plateau, I'll call that A, that is connected to the high voltage terminal of the battery, that's our, the top of the line. We also have Whatever is connected to the lower voltage terminal of the battery is going to be the bottom. I'm going to, with some advantage of some foresight, I'm going to label it as D because I know that there are going to be two more. Here's another one, B, and here's another one, C. There was my equipotential regions. So what's going to happen? Current is going to flow. Current flows from A to B. I total equals I1. So there's no forks yet. So whatever total current is going to flow is going to pass through resistor 1. That's the only way to get from A to B. But now you have choices. Once you've arrived at B, your end goal is D, which is the lowest voltage terminal, but you have two choices. You can either go through resistor 2 and be there directly, or you have the option of going through resistor 3, that's I3, but then of course you have to continue going. 
can't just end up there. You have to wind up at the battery to get uh, pumped back up. I'm going to go ahead and draw my voltage waterfall. Okay. So draw my equipotentials. I'm going to draw in my currents. And I'm going to go ahead and draw in my waterfall to help my information. Here's what I have. So I have that there is my highest voltage equipotential, that's step A, my next one is B, and I only have one option to get between them, that's the voltage drop across 1. The bottom of the line is D, and um, I have the option to go between those two through resistor 2, or I can do it in a two-step manner through 3 and 4. So this is a kind of a complicated looking waterfall, right? So we have a one drop at the top and then we have a split where you can go all the way down to the bottom or you can continue in a two-step manner to the bottom as well. All right, so now we've, we've set ourselves up for success, okay? We've set ourselves up for success. Now we identify series elements and parallel elements. Series elements are things where they have the same current going through them. So what goes through one must go through the other. And parallel elements are ones that are, have the same voltage drop. So they allow you to drop down from one voltage region to another. Uh, and you give, uh, parallel elements give you different options to do that. So let's start. Let me ask you this. Uh, are R2 and R3 in parallel? No. Because this one offers you a drop from B to D. This one offers you a drop from B to C. Okay? Not giving you two different choices between the same two endpoints. Okay? Can I say R2 and R4 are in parallel? No. Because this is B to D. This is C to D. Okay? In fact, right now, there is nothing in parallel with anything else. No two individual resistors are in parallel. There is no two resistors that allow you to drop between the same two places. Okay? Let's talk about series. Let's look for something in series. Can I say R1 and R2 are in series? No, you can't. Because the current that goes through here does not have to go through here. It can also go over here. So you can see that the total current, right, it doesn't have to go through here. There is two resistors, however, that what goes through one has to go through the other, by vice versa. These two, right? Because once you've committed to this branch, you have to finish that branch. So in fact, I3 and I4 are one and the same thing. In fact, I'm just going to label it I34. So, what do I do? I go ahead and I figure out what is the combined resistance of that branch. I, since I know they're in series, I can use the series rule. And if I add those two, uh, that's uh, 80 ohms and 30 ohms, I'll get that the resistance of that branch is 110 ohms. And now, once you've done that, the best thing for, that I would recommend, especially when you're new at this, is to redraw and repeat. Okay? So I'll kind of do this in a circle. Because it allows you to remove the clutter. We're basically going to now think of resistors 3 and 4 as one resistor. So I'm going to redraw it. It looks like this. and then we begin the process again. It might even be helpful to redraw the equipotentials. I've got region A, I've got region D, and I've got region B. 
Now, if you're asking where C went, C is gone. Why is C gone? C used to be the middle step between resistors 3 and 4. And there is no middle region anymore because I've condensed 3 and 4 into a single one. So remember that every time that you combine into a series, you will eliminate one or more equipotential regions. Okay? It's basically the middle steps in, in there in that series are gone because you're imagining that entire series is one. Okay. So let's now again look for series of parallel things. Can I say that uh, R1 and R2 are in series? No? Not the same current? Can I say R1 and R34 are in series? No? Not the same current, right? Remember there's a fork here. How about R2 and R3? R2 and R34, rather. They're parallel, that's right, because they both give you options to go from region B and D. If you're trying to get from region B to region D, you have two different options to do that. So R2 and R34 are parallel. So let's work that out. I'm going to call the results R234, because it's going to incorporate all three of those. Now we use our rule, our one over rule. Um, R2 is uh, 40 ohms, and this we found was 110 ohms, and if you calculate R234, now this is one thing we remember about parallel, does the total resistance come out to be less than 40, between 40 and 110, or more than 110? Less than 40, right? Because remember, a 40 ohm if you put an extra branch, extra branch is always better to have than not. So in fact, if you do that, you'll get a resistance of 29 and a third ohms. And then let's redraw. Region, uh, that's R1, and this is R234. So we have region A, B, and D now. Notice that in the equipotential regions are all still there from the last step. You don't kill an equipotential when you add something in parallel. All you're doing is condensing the options between them, right? So we have had regions B and D, and we took the two options you had to get between them and condensed them into one option, okay? So all the equipotentials are still there from the last step. Now we can look at these two and say what? How, what is the relationship between these two? They're in series, right? Because if you go through R1, you have to continue on through R234, which of course is just saying that if the total current flows through R1, it has to go through 2, 3, and 4 somewhere, right? It doesn't have to go through any one of them, but it has to go through it in totality. So finally, I reserve REQ for the very last step the combined resistance of the whole thing, that's going to be R1 plus R234, and that's going to be 49.33 ohms. That's the equivalent resistance of the whole circuit. And the circuit will sense how much resistance in the path, and the total current will be determined by this. So step three is to take the total current and figure it out using the known battery voltage and the amount of resistance in the path. So in my case, that will be 12 volts over this equivalent resistance. That will be, if I do this correctly, 0.243 amps, or 243 milliamps. And notice that I do have, I am going through the numbers, I'm not doing this symbolically, because it would be really crazy if I try to do that. Um, so do ma make sure to keep enough sig figs here, at least three, so you don't have any progressive round off. So, once you have that total current, basically the main reason that you find the equivalent resistance of the whole circuit 
is to know how much current will then be flowing as a result of it. Now, what we've just finished putting together, we're going to start unfurling and taking back apart again. So I go over to my chart, and I have somewhere to start, because I know that this is 0.243. Now, how do I know that? Remember, we established that the total current goes through resistor 1. There's no forks yet, right? So whatever total current flows goes through that one. And now, we can start to reap the benefits of being organized from the outset. So, where do we go next? Well, once you have one value in a row, you can get on the other one, because I know the resistance, so if I have the current, I can get the voltage. So, let's do it. I know V1 equals I1 R1. So, 0.243 amps times the resistance, which is uh, 20 ohms. And I'll get a voltage drop there of 4.9 volts. I've got this row filled in, and I'm ready to move on. I know everything I need to know about resistor 1. So I just found out that this thing was 4.9 volts right here. I also know that the, that the whole drop is 12 volts. So where do I go next? What do I know? What can I get almost right away? B2. B2, that's right. Because I can. You drop the entire rest of the voltage if you decide to go through resistor 2. So I go ahead and I say that V2, or I say that the EMF is V1 plus V2, and I can solve there for V2. And V2 ends up being 7.1 volts. So now I've got a value in the next row. It may not necessarily be in the next row, but it will be another row, right? Now what did I get? I've got the V2, so I can get I2, right? Once you know one value in a row, you're good to go with the other one. All right. If you work that out, that should come out to be 0 0.178 amps, or 178 milliamps. Put that in, 0.178 amps. Okay, so where do we go next? Well, uh, if we know this is 7.1 volts, we can't necessarily have that and say that V3 and V4 are each half of that, right? That's not the way it works in series, right? In series, they'll add up to 7.1, but the larger resistance will get more. And we do have that those two resistors are unequal. So we have to go for another route. And that other route is looking at the current. We had 243 milliamps coursing through this one, but there's only 178 going this way. Where did the rest go? Go through the other branch, that's right. So let's do that. We know that I total forks off, part of it goes to resistor 2, but part of it goes to resistors 3 and 4. So we can solve for I3, 4. That's the rest. That is uh, 0.065 amps, or uh, 65 milliamps. And nicely. We can actually go ahead and copy it. Remember, that's the current for both of those resistors, because they're in series. Why is there so little current going through this branch? Why is it only 65 amps going through here, or 65 milliamps, when uh, 178 is going through the other way? Because the resistance is exactly. This resistance is even slower, half of least resistance, right? R2 is way smaller of a resistance than R34. So all the things that we learned about are part of this bigger problem, right? You can still look for that intuition. Now, I guess just to close it out, 
We can, of course, find the voltages. Once you have one value in a row, the other one, you're good to go. Uh, V3 is going to be I3, R3. And V4 is going to be I4, R4. And those values will be 5.2 and 1.9. I'll ask them to keep an up with that problem solving strategy. So break it back apart. That's really the, the thing. So we go over here. We found that this one was uh, 5.2 volts. This was 1.9. It's reassuring to see that they add up to what? 7.1, which they should. But why does the R3 take out so much more of the voltage drop? Its resistance is higher. Remember, in series, the larger resistance will take more. So 80 ohms takes 5.2 volts, and this much smaller 30 ohm resistance is only going to take 1.9. So you see it all ties this up, up very nicely. We get consistent results at the end. That's basically the strategy for attacking combo circuits. Make sure that you are able to do that. You'll find a lot of it on the homework. You'll find a lot of it on the practice exam. Okay, go ahead and put a line in your notes. End of homework three in exam one material. We'll start some new stuff next time.